Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. But yeah, I just want to encourage you, man. It's uh, everybody is fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, if you just go back to like how you even got here, you know, I, I don't even know the billions going genetic on you, billions of sperm for one to fertilize the egg. I mean, you should do that research. It blew my mind. The number was so big, it was astronomical. So you were designed for this place, this season. And like, if anybody in here is questioning God this morning, like, this is how amazing God is. Look down at just one finger and look down at one square inch of one finger and no one in the world, past, present, or future has your divine fingerprint. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I used to watch like forensic files and like, how they're gonna bust this guy? Who did it? You know, and I was so excited. But most of it was, let's find fingerprint evidence. And so what I believe God is trying to tell you is that he wants you to have your unique fingerprint on this earth, in this season, at this time. And when you leave an area, there should be a fingerprint of God, a residue that's left there. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, that's just a warm up. Now we're ready. <laughs> well, God's been taking me on a journey uh, lately, and I, I hope to inspire, encourage some of you. Maybe you're on this same kind of journey, and uh, I'm still working it out. I haven't arrived, so uh, bear with me. But uh, the seeds that he's been planting in my life, I think, may benefit some of you. And so, um, you know, I'm going to tell you a story a little bit about the home we've got and stuff, but uh, we're trying to get some equity out of the home. And so I had to raise the credit rating a little bit, uh, been working on all that, and we just hit roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. And so what was for like most people, like two, three, four week process, we are at the seven month mark. So let me give you some hope. So like, you know, I'm a man of patience. You know, I can, I can weather any storm, train Marine, bring it. You know, I'm going to some way climb over, climb under, go around, go through, you know, but you're not going to stop me. Yeah, I'm like that Terminator. You can blow him apart. And he's still going to come back and go after you. So uh, that's the kind of attitude we need to have when it's, uh, the devil should be shaken right now. So uh, but yeah, so like I was just I was starting to get frustrated. You know, because it's like, I don't, I'm not expecting easy in life, but normal would be nice. Just for some stuff to work out like normally, like most of the time. And it was just frustration after frustration to the point where it was stealing all the joy. And so I got some great wisdom, uh, unpacking like a, a generational curse, and uh, I'm on that process right now. But God in this season kept bringing up this word called rest, you know, and it's like, I ain't got time to rest. Anybody relate? But it's like he brought me back to the creation story and how special that seventh day was, that day of rest, and that I needed to find some rest, find some peace amongst all the chaos, all the frustration, and how to find that. And so that's the journey I've been on. And then it's like, you know, we... Believe it or not, we were designed to live in rest and on purpose. And the devil has hijacked that original intent, that original agenda. And we generally live stress, toil, sweat, always working, always hustling. And it's more of a survival story than it is a purpose story. And I mean, think about it. It's like, do you guys think like me? Everybody kind of probably has the secret dream of winning the lottery. And then, but why do we want to win the lottery? Yes, it's to buy all the stuff that we always wish we could have. But I think if you talk to people that have bought all the stuff, it loses its luster. But what really resonates and what resonates with me and probably with you is if you had all the money in the world, you could live a life on purpose. That's how God intended us, to live a life on purpose. And we're going to unpack that a little bit here today. How do we get back to the original intent where everything was created, it was given to us, there was no toil, stress, 
fear, worry, doubt, anxiety. We could rest, walk with God in the cool of the evening, and live a life on purpose. Does that sound pretty good? All right, well, let's dig into this thing. So first of all, if you're a Christian, you have legal rights. And I've never really heard much teaching on legal rights, but there's a lot of rights God left us clues in this Bible. And we, our homework assignment is really start to understand what our rights are. Because we believe God is a king, the king of kings, and he has a kingdom. And so, you know, how do we live in God's kingdom, not in the devil's kingdom? Stress, toil, worry, anxiety, all of that is the devil's kingdom, but we have been redeemed. And so let's unpack that. But before I do that, on this journey of rest, I was talking with my brother-in-law, Dustin Wilson, right there, second row. Love that man. He is on a hunt for God like nobody I've ever seen. So proud of you, brother. But he gave me a book called The Power of Rest. Isn't it amazing when we're hungry for something, God brings people, brings books, brings opportunity. I encourage you, be hungry for God. He's going to give you what you need. And so this book, Power of Rest, he just gave it to me like three days ago. And so I was chaperoning a lot of cherished ladies to a concert this week. I didn't want to go, but they did. So uh, I found a parking spot with a floodlight, whipped out a table, glass of whiskey, and the book. Just being honest. Just being honest. Don't judge me. Who's judging me right now? Somebody out there. So... So anyway, I whip out this book, and I start learning our legal rights, going back, you know, to how we were created, how Jesus uh, restored us, and how we're supposed to live in kingdom experience. So that's my message for today. Amen? All right. Ephesians 29 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and member of God's household. So we are sons and daughters of the king and part of his kingdom. And anyone like me, you kind of forget that from time to time. You just think like, man, I'm in this world's kingdom, all the stress, you know, but let's get back to like, we are God's kids. We're supposed to live a kingdom life. We're not supposed to wait for eternity to have all the fun and do all the things we've dreamed of. It's supposed to be here on earth should echo what's going to happen in heaven. Amen. So the title of my message this morning is kingdom come. We need a kingdom comeback. So, point one of three or four or maybe six, we'll see how much time we have. There's probably only three, uh, is kingdom loss. So, what was God's original intent? What did we originally have? What did he originally create? So, you got to go back into the Bible in creation. God created the earth for us. We had abundance. We had unlimited provision. We had authority. We had dominion over every bird of the air, beast of the field, creepy, crawly thing, and everything under the sun. That's what God created. He created man, created woman, and then he rested on that seventh day and said, go enjoy. Let's walk in the cool of the evening. I have provided everything your heart could desire. I just want you. You are my reward. I built all of this for you. So that was God's original intent, that he gave it all to us. And so on the seventh day, that Sabbath day, that day of rest, you know, that's such an important day that God only has 10 commandments. And the fourth is to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. And so that's a deeper dive. I'm on that journey myself of like, God, you know, my grandmother, we'd go to church. She'd make a meal. We'd just sit, relax, have fun. She would not allow you to pick up a rake, do anything in the yard. And so for her, honoring the Sabbath was to do no work to really get refreshed, to enjoy fellowship with people and dinners and games. And I really think we need to get back to that and figure out what rest looks like for you. Because think about it. If we're just go, go, go seven days a week, look at the world we're living in. You know, in the military, you've got a heightened sense of safety, security, the enemy. And it's like we've been living like that for two years. That's not good for soldiers, and it's definitely not good for you to live in that heightened sense of adrenaline. So now more than ever, the power of rest is needed in our life. So I'm going to let you guys kind of unpack that. So there we were, Genesis 2, 3. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. So I believe that was the day of rest. And then in Genesis 2, 15, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Now, when you see work and take care of it, it's not like the work we're doing today. Do you know what that speaks of to me? 
purpose. You have to have a vision. You have to have a purpose. Because if it's all fun and games, but there's no purpose, you live an empty life. So I think God is trying to tell all of us, like, go back to the purpose of what I created you for. That's when you're going to be the most enjoying. You're going to have the greatest sense of just, you know, just everything, adrenaline, passion, commitment. I know when I do things that I love that God put passions in me, I could go two, three in the morning, and it's like it was eight o'clock in the morning. I have endless energy. So just take a pause right there, and in your notes, like, where is God giving you a passion for something? I think that's going to be the key to your breakthrough, especially in the area of, of abundance. So there we are. But wait, we had everything, everything we needed. We had rest, we had purpose, but then we traded everything for a piece of fruit. Think about that. I mean, it hit me. You know, this week, I was like, dang it, a piece of fruit? How dumb can you be? I was even reading in the Bible, I can't remember the verse, but the word stupid is in there. And I was like, Adam, I mean, I want to go to heaven. I don't know about you guys. I'm going to go find Adam. I'm going to look him in the face and say, dude, what the hell, oh, were you thinking? And then give him a freaking left hook. I was like, do you know the toil, the sweat, the pain for survival I had to live because you screwed it up. But I don't think God wants me to do that, so forgive me. Anyway, just being real up here. So there we were. We traded all for a piece of fruit. Then sin entered the world. You know, kingdom reign transferred from Adam and Eve to Satan. It happened in that moment. It was a horrible decision that they made. And the results have been, is your life got some toil, got some sweat, got some stress, got some anxiety? Are you trying to pay Peter, Rob Paul, jockeying all the bills, trying to make ends meet. That's not how we were designed to live. And we're going to give you some hope this morning. So I had made, uh, you know, some bad decisions and, uh, you know, but that one's got to be the worst. And as President Trump would say, that was huge. <laughs> but when I go to heaven, man, it's just like, you know, it's like, I want to live a kingdom come on this life. I want to redeem what Adam and Eve lost. Is anybody with me? Come on, we're going to figure out how to do that. So again, when we read that verse, Genesis 2, 17 through 19, it says, Cursed is the ground because of you. He was looking right at Adam. Cursed is the ground because of you. I'm not going to curse you, Adam, but I'm going to curse the ground because you made a bad decision. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. So we were not cursed. So I don't know if you're living with guilt or shame and you're beating yourself up for bad decisions, that's the devil's voice whispering in your heart. You know, it's not God. So let's bind that right now. So if you're in here, you're in the lobby, you're watching online, and you're feeling like you've got too much toil, stress, struggle in your life, I want to give you hope. And so that's how it started. And then God realized that I can't use sinful man to redeem the kingdom. I need to use perfect man, Jesus Christ. So point number two is kingdom restored. So God wanted to restore that kingdom that he created, and so he sent Jesus Christ to restore the original design and intent. And it, wasn't it kind of cool that like Jesus, 30 years, you don't hear much about it, but I love that verse. He grew in favor and stature with God and man. Are you growing right now? in favor and stature with God and man. And don't judge how long it's been. Jesus, God's perfect son, spent 30 years studying, watching, found in his father's house, listening, hearing, you know, getting in tune with his dad. So when it was go time at that 30-year mark, he only needed a three-year ministry. So let's unpack how he restored the kingdom. So first of all, uh, Jesus showed us what is possible in our life here on earth. And there are many examples. You know, nature, for example. You know, there we are. He could calm the seas. He can, you know, calm the wind. He could walk on water. He could defy gravity. I mean, that's pretty amazing. You think like, yeah, he's Jesus. But guess who else walked on water? He was a human, Peter. There's hope right there. If he can do it, why can't we? All right, then there's more, you know, provision. Anybody need a little bit more provision? I'm raising my hand. Okay, I think most of us in here, more blessing, more things you can do. So think about it. You know, there was a story of uh, the wedding feast, 
and Jesus was there. It wasn't his time to do any miracles. And mom came up and said, you better do it, son. And as anybody knows, if you're wise, honor mama, else things will not go well with you if you don't. (laughs) So he honored her, and he turned the water that was remaining into wine. And not just any wine, but the best wine. And then his disciples like, hey, we need to pay taxes. We got nothing in, you know, in the account. He's like, what do you got? Fishing pole. Go fishing. And they pulled a gold coin out of a fish's mouth and paid the tax. And then there's these multitudes following him. And they come up and say, Jesus, how are we going to feed the 5,000? He's like, what do you got? I got fish and bread, the small boy's lunch. And that was all he needed. So what do these three stories have in common? And how can that build our faith? What they have in common is there was something in their hand already. If you don't remember anything from this message today, God is saying there is something in your hand I've already given you to bring the miracle. You just got to dig deep and figure out what it is. So in these three stories, they still had water. They didn't have wine. Jesus could use that. They needed tax money. They had a fishing pole in their hand. Jesus could use that. They didn't have food for the people, but they had a little basket. Jesus could use that. We have that same power in us, in case you forgot. Don't listen to the devil. Jesus didn't just walk around earth and just show us a bunch of stuff that we can't do. He showed it to inspire us to do this and greater works. Amen? And we're going to unpack that a little bit. So, My question to you today is what is in your hand that is God is waiting for you to produce abundance? Let me give you a story. You know, for for years, God's been telling me to start a creative business. And he knows it's a passion of mine. I have a skill set in it. And the way he wired me is like, I see what other people see as junk. And I was like, what could that be? I see the uniqueness of that that rusty old steel barrel at a merge, half buried that Pastor Jeff, uh, what's that? Address the noise at the air show. I got military hearing, so I haven't heard one thing. Are we, am I missing something? All right, focus on me, not on the air show. I guess there's some noise in the room. So thank you, I needed that. So literally, I haven't heard anything about the air show. So, so there we were, rusty old barrel in the dirt. I'm out there with Pastor Jeff, and he's like, oh yeah, that thing's getting bulldozed right into the dumpster. I was like, Jeff. That could be an end table with light shooting out of the shrapnel holes with the whiskey barrel cover in my office. And guess what? It is today in my office. (laughs) But that creative ability, you know, God has put creative ability in you. God was a creator. Jesus was a creator. He loved to work with some wood. But what God showed me is like as much passion as you have of taking stuff that people would throw away. I'm going to let you pursue that. I'm going to show you what it could be. But the real kingdom impact of that is you're going to take people that the world has thrown away, that are maybe a little rusty, a little dusty, a little beat, a little bruised, and you're going to see what they can be and what God called them to be. Amen? And that's not just reserved for me. You guys have a passion. You have a skill. You've got a talent. You've got ability. God has been speaking into your life, maybe for weeks or months, or in my case, years. And he's ready for us to launch and watch how he is going to bless it. Amen. Amen. So let me unpack this, this verse that just blew my mind. It's John 14, 12. Let's see if we can bring that up. In just a minute. There it is. In Jesus' name, it's happening right now. John 14, 12. Oh, come on, drum roll. Okay, here it is. I know it's going to come. So, ah, hey, look at that. (laughs) You have not because you asked not. So, all right, so look at this verse. I want to encourage you. It says, most assuredly, in that word, most is with certainty, with absolute beyond a shadow of a doubt, most assuredly. I say to who? To you. That's each and every one of us in this room. Nobody else, not like look at me, I'm saying to you with certainty. He who believes in me, that is the number one key to your breakthrough, is who you believe in. Devil's voice, God's voice. 
I encourage you to read that Bible, speak it over to your life. But say, you got to believe in me. You got to have some faith. You got to have some belief. And all he needs is a mustard seed. We can move a mountain with a mustard seed. That's encouraging because I don't need to have this big, bold, audacious faith like Pastor Jeff to launch a business, to buy a multi-million dollar home. I mean, just incredible what his faith is doing in his life. And I remember just a couple years ago, man, that old beat up Ford Silver, you're trying to keep that thing running, always at the shop. I mean, there was no tread on those tires. They were slicks. They were ready for the racetrack. And look at his life in just a couple short years because he had faith, he had belief. And he stepped out and he used what God put in his hand. So that's what God's telling him. Believe in me and the works that I do. This isn't just, hey, hey, look at me. I'm big Jesus. No, the works that I do, this is the best part. You will do also, but there's more. And greater works than these will he do. Now, just pausing on that a minute. If we could just do the works that Jesus did, heal the sick, you know, eyesight restored to the blind, the leprosy gone, you know, just if we did some of those, that would be great. That would be amazing. I mean, Pastor John, every time he comes up here for miracles, he steps out in faith. He steps out with boldness. He knows that it isn't in his strength that someone's going to receive a miracle, but it's in his partnership with the one that produces the miracle. And that's what I want to encourage you guys today. It's your partnership with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the power within that will produce the miracle in your life. And then it ends with, after greater works than these, he would do because I go to my father. I go to my father. What does that mean? You don't need me here. I did my three-year journey. I taught, I equipped, I modeled, I showed. Now go and do. And so guess what? After three years with Jesus, the disciples, they went and did. And they did some amazing things. I mean, handkerchief, you know, healing people, shadows healing people. So do you think that was lost and it was only imparted to the disciples? That would be the greatest letdown in biblical history if all of that work and greater works ended with the disciples. No. It is on our watch. We've got that same ability. We've got that same power. Is anybody ready to use that power? I mean, I can't wait to beat the devil with something. And like, you know, in my own life, I'm, I'm exercising little pieces of it. And I want to encourage you to do the same. You know, I, I've shared the story about health and healing. It's like if anybody is sick in here, continually sick, same kind of things, or a new thing comes up, just bind it and be done with it. That's what I did. Pastor Quacha knows. It's like there's some stuff you get to a point, you are fed up, and you said never again. And like I said, I think I'm on like 12, 13-year run of no sniffle, sneeze, sickness. Anybody that knows me, when have I been sick? You know, and so God honored my faith, that mustard seed of faith. And I've actually seen it in my, my kids. I can't remember the last time they've been sick. Isn't that amazing? Generationally, I'm changing a curse of sickness. Every fuller in my family died of diabetes and complications and blindness, you know, but not on my watch. You can stop generational curses on your watch. You just got to believe. You got to have some power. You got to have some faith. Stop taking it from the devil. I mean, you weren't meant to be Rocky Balboa pushed in the rings and just pummeled. Sometimes you got to get up, take the hit, and keep on moving. Amen? So that's a life Jesus was trying to tell us, I want you to live. And he says in John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. So yeah, we've got life, we're living, we're breathing. But if you're not living the more abundant life, we got to just start going to God and unpacking that. God, show me the abundant life. I know you're no respecter of persons. I know that what you've done for, you know, people on the front row with houses and cars and vacations, God wants you to have the same thing. And I believe literally that he has already placed a seed of greatness in your hand. So think about it. You can't earn any more favor from God. God can't impart any more gifting into you. Talent, skill, you've already got it. That's why that one square inch is so unique. You have everything inside of you right now to live the life that you deserve. You just have to go on the journey to discover it. You got to be a hunter. I'm a hunter. 
So hunt for your purpose, your passion, your skill set, and watch what God would do. You know, so I, I just want to encourage you guys this morning. So, you know, um, a, another story is, you know, God had showed me about, um, you know, buying a home. And so, believe it or not, for 30 years, I rented. And so maybe you guys can relate. What are you believing for? But you're listening to the lies of the devil. And I had great friends encourage me. Friends would pick me up, take me to a house for sale and say, that house has got your name all over it. And what I do, I look at the price tag. I look at one income family. I look at like, what's the mortgage? What's the utilities? That doesn't have solar on it. What's that power bill? That look at all that vegetation that needs to be watered. And I have all these thoughts going through my mind. But uh, it just reminded me about like the 12 spies. God's watching. Are you listening to the 10 voices? We're like grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way they're big. We're going down. Or you're like, we can take these guys. It's no issue, no problem. Our God is with us. So I don't know about you guys, but 30 years is a long time to process. I want to give you some hope. You know, I don't know if anybody else has waited to buy a house for 30 years. I know you young people out here, you want to buy a house? You can. Yeah. Learn from me. Don't listen to the voices I listen to. So what was my transition point? And I, I want to encourage you. I believe God is already speaking to you the next key to your breakthrough. And it's consistent voice. It comes up, radio, people saying something. But you know that you know that you know inside your heart that there is something you have yet to overcome. God's encouraging you. He's with you. He is like waiting at that finish line to champion you for running your race. But guess what? That's life. You've got to run your race. You've got to overcome whatever is holding you back. So for me, why was it a 30-year journey? That would have been a one-year journey. But what it was was trusting God. You know, when you grow up without a father figure... You don't know how to trust. Every man in your life has let you down. And I know a lot of people can relate. So as good as my God was, as much as I went to church every Sunday for 18 years, and I listened to the word, I knew it was true, but I still had to trust God. That was my skin in the game. And I had to trust him in the area of finances is where he specifically spoke to me. And I knew that I knew that I knew, man. I, he even gave me like a glimpse, like, you cannot imagine what I'm going to do when you overcome this, son. Yeah. But you still got to overcome it. You know, I was living paycheck to paycheck. When was this bill due? Jocking, you know, calling the girls' school. Hey, can you move the payment three days later? I'm giving you some real stories here. I've never shared this before, but uh, there is a couple points in that journey where... Uh, I couldn't do it in my strength anymore and uh, actually had a, uh, a car repossessed. I don't know if anybody can relate to that, but uh, that was a low point. I know. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. But I tell you this stuff to give you hope. God was still with me. The devil was working me, but God was just waiting for me to take that step of faith. And so... I'm a little thick-headed. Don't be like me. God, ha God had to bring me to my knees where I could no longer do it in my strength. And it was in that moment I fell to my knees, cried out to heaven. I said, God, you've been patient. You've been kind. You've been whispering. I know what I need to do. But help me to trust you. I haven't seen it modeled. I don't know what it looks like. I know you're a great father, but I don't know how to be a son. I never had that. So you got to teach me. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Just trust me. And so I went all in. And I remember hearing these ties, stories of like, if I couldn't pay the mortgage, if I couldn't pay the next bill, God is getting the first fruits of my income. I'm going all in. I'm trusting him. And I don't care. And I tell Tessa this. If it's me, you, and a cardboard box, but we've got God, we've got the world. I said that. And so that is the day that I beat the devil in what he was, he was holding back from me and God was wanting to bless me. That's the day we found this amazing home. 
We bought it at the start of COVID, under price. And in two years later in the California economy, just last week, we got an appraisal. That house has doubled in value. That is the power of trusting God. A 30 year journey, a moment of trust, and he doubled it. And then he threw in an extra house on the East Coast for a rental property seven months later, but we won't go there. So that's an encouraging word. So the kingdom has been restored and God wants you to experience it. That's my third point. So how do we experience this? Remember, you have the legal rights. You have Jesus as the example, the role model, shows you what's possible, what you can do, has encouraged you, said greater works will you do. So now, just like me in that journey of buying a home, it's on you. Each and every one of you, you now have to take the first step to victory, which is that step of faith. It is literally all throughout this Bible, what's the constant theme? It's faith. All the miracles, all the crazy stories, all the impossible becoming possible. Guess what it was? It wasn't their skill, talent, ability, strength. It was the measure of their faith. Abraham is considered the father of faith. I mean, here he is aged. He's been wanting a family and it just didn't happen. But he said that he went all in. He was fully persuaded to trust God. And God said, that's what I'm looking for. And think about that. When you are fully persuaded to trust God, what's your life gonna look like in the next six months, in the next six years? God is waiting on you. The ball is in your court. The ball is in your hand. And so if everybody could just stand, I wanna pray over you as we close out today. And just close your eyes, open your palms to heaven. I want you to just receive a unique word to you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your sons and daughters here. God, just like we talked about, they're fearfully and wonderfully made. One inch on their finger shows their uniqueness. God, you've given them unique skills, talents, and ability. Every single one of them, you have never made another. Not past, not present, not future. God, you put them in this state in this city, in this church, to make a kingdom impact. So God, speak to them right now. What have you placed in their heart? A business idea, something they're supposed to do, a book they're supposed to write, an orphanage they're supposed to start, a ministry, a network. What have you placed in their heart? And it's that still small voice whispering to them, it's time, it's time, it's time. I'm with you. It's not in your strength. You don't have to figure it all out. You don't have to know the next step. I just need you to take one step, one step of faith, then a second step of faith. I'm gonna align people, opportunities. I'm gonna open doors. You're gonna spend time with me. I'm gonna show you this journey. It's gonna be one of peace because I'm with you. And that's how I know that we're on the journey is because you give me the glory and because you're sold out to what I wanna do in and through your life. So God, for everyone in this room, may that be a word, speak to them now. God, let them leave this service today and to put action behind that word. God, what this church will look like in the next year, we can imagine. It's gonna be powerful. It's gonna be incredible. It's gonna be one of hope. We're gonna have so many testimonies, they're gonna echo across the world is what happened with the revival of awakened church. Amen, amen. That is your mission, that is your assignment. God wanted me to unpack that for you. And let's close with one more thing. If you can close your eyes, bow your head one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for the opportunity to be in your house on your platform. And God, as good as this message might have been, it was from you. But this message was also meant to penetrate a heart 
and a mind of a son and daughter that doesn't know you, that doesn't know the stories in the Bible, that doesn't have a measure of faith, but God, you have been knocking on their door their entire life. And God, this is their moment. They finally came into your house. God, they heard your word. And God, all they have to do is take that same action step of faith and trust your son, Jesus Christ. So if anyone is in here today, that you don't know Jesus Christ. You want to live this epic kingdom come life, but you need to take the first step and trust Jesus Christ. If there's anybody in here today, just raise your hand high, raise it proud. The angels are cheering, God is cheering, this church is cheering. Do not leave here today without knowing your Lord and Savior. So thank you, God. Thank you for just hands going up all over this room. Thank you for hands in the lobby. Thank you for the people watching online. God, we just thank you that no one's leaving here today without having the greatest father, the greatest power operating in and through their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen. For more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.